Hey there team, next property. So we did ionization energy. Kind of the opposite of that would be electron affinity. Ionization is ionization energy is how much energy it takes to remove an electron to form a cation. Well, electron affinity is the amount of the energy change when you uh, add an electron, right? Usually if it's neutral, it forms an anion or you could add it to anything really. So whatever energy change occurs, when it captures an, electro, an electron in the gas phase, by definition, is your electron affinity. So whatever that species is, in this case, it happens to be neutral, gains an electron, right? But if, it's, if it was a negative one, it would become negative two. If it was a positive two, it would become a positive one, right? You're just reducing the overall charge by one in the gas phase. So the first electron captured is Ea sub one, or the first electron affinity. It parallels ionization energy exactly. So we can add another electron, we could add two electrons, we could keep adding electrons <laughs> until our heads fall off, right? But it takes a tremendous amount of energy, and we'll talk about uh, Ea2s and Ea3s on the next board. The main difference between electron affinity and ionization energy, ionization energies are always endothermic, always positive, because you're popping a negative electron from a positive charged nucleus. Electron affinity, though, has more to do about what its starting electron configuration is, and after you add the electron, what's its ending electron configuration? Is that ending electron, does it create, adding that electron, does that create a more favorable electron configuration that's lower energy? Remember, we want filled subshells, half-filled subshells, those kinds of things. It wants to become like the noble gas. So electron affinity values are a little trickier. They could be positive or negative, right? So if you have a negative electron affinity value, that's exothermic, which means it's releasing energy, and so it became more favorable. So we tend to use the term more favorable. See, ionization energy, they're all positive. You could say greater or smaller. You can't really do that with electron affinity because if some values are negative and some are positive, right? Or if they're all negative and you say greater, well, is it greater numerically, which would mean it's a lower value? Uh, you see the confusion? So when I talk about electron affinities, I talk about is it more favorable? Is that process more favorable? And it goes to a lower energy state, which would have a negative value. It's exothermic. Or is it not favorable? No, I don't want the electron. Uh, and it goes up in energy. You crammed an electron and it made it a, a less uh, energetically favorable electron configuration. Well, that would be not favorable or positive, right? It's going up in energy. doesn't want to do that. So that would be endothermic. Depends on the electron configuration. Oh, now let's look at what happens if we, for all of them, if we add a second electron, what happens? We'll look at some specific values and talk about why those values change. The trends are not nearly as nice as ionization energy because the changing electron configurations, but let's take a look at it. Let's take a look at what happens, kind of like we did with ionization energy. You could go I1, I2, I3, and it took successively more energy each time you pulled a negative particle away from a positive nucleus, right? But when you're adding electrons, it's different. All right, there's still electric, think about electrostatic, like charges repel, opposite charges attract. So we're, we're cramming electrons in now. So if you cram that first one in to get the first electron affinity, based on the electron configuration change, it could be favorable or exothermic negative or not favorable, positive or endothermic, right? But the second electron affinity, if you're taking an anion, remember, you've already added an electron and you're trying to cram another electron onto it, the electron's negative, the anion's negative, wah, wah, wah. negative charges repel, not happy. That's not a favorable process. Anytime you're trying to add an electron to a negatively charged species, and the more negatively charged it is, the more dramatic the repulsion, that's always gonna be positive or endothermic, not favorable. So the second electron affinities and third and fourth and fifth, every time you add another electron, adding an electron to a negative two anion is harder to do than a negative one. Adding an electron to a negative three anion is way harder to do than a negative two anion. So each successive electron you add gets harder and harder and harder to do, it becomes more positive, more positive, more endothermic, right? So there's a limit. So hopefully that makes sense. Ea2 values are always, always positive. So let me show a couple specific ones and, 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 and have those values written down, yay. Let's combine a problem exactly like we did for ionization energy. Gotta put the math in there, right? Uh, and look at the first electron affinity and the second electron affinity. 
So let's say we got some sulfur. Let's say it's in the gas phase. We want to convert it to the sulfide ion, S2 minus, that we're all familiar with. Oh, here comes the cat. There goes the cat. Thought I was going to step on my laptop. Uh oh, here he comes again. Hold on. The paranoid of a cat coming up and going, chunka, 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 and screwing up the whole video. They love to run on laptop keyboards. Oh, okay, anyway. So what's the energy change that occurs when you're converting neutral sulfur in the, in the gas phase to the, the anion negative two? Because we know it wants to be negative two, right? Oxygen, sulfur, selenium, all those chalcogens want to be isoelectronic with an ex-noble gas. So they like that negative two charge. But let's take a look and see if that it really is that energetically favorable. Let's say we have 0.96 grams of sulfur and somehow we got it in the gas phase. And we're just assuming it's monatomic, not S8 or anything like that. So step one, we got to add the first electron. Now that first electron that we add is favorable. It's negative 200.4 kilojoules per mole. So it, it's, it's happy to get that because it's one step closer to getting to that noble gas core electron configuration. So let's calculate the energy change in taking 0.96 grams of neutral sulfur to 0.96 grams of S minus in the gas phase. So take the mass, we need to convert that to moles, right? Because the energy is in kilojoules per mole. So take the amount of moles, just like we did. It's exactly the same as the ionization energy problem. It's just the EA values are different. So sulfur, what's that, 32.066 right there? So 32.066 grams per mole. And it's negative 200.4 kilojoules are released because it's going to a lower energy state. That difference is released. Um, and so we've got two significant digits, five and four. So to two significant digits, the energy would be negative 5.999 kilojoules, good to two sig phase. So that's how much energy is released, converting 0.96 grams of neutral sulfur in the gas phase to sulfur minus one. But now we want to add that second electron to get to that noble gas core electron configuration. So there's your anion. But wait a minute, you're adding an electron that's negative to another electron that's negative, that's not favorable, is it? EA2 values are always endothermic, highly so. Trying to cram that negative particle into a negative anion, it's repulsive, baby. So it's 694 kilojoules per mole to cram that other electron in there. It's like, no, no. Even though it's getting to the noble gas core electron configuration, you've got to overcome those electrostatic forces of repulsion. So same thing, put, take the 0.96 grams of the S minus. We're assuming the S minus, adding an electron does not change the mass because an electron is, it's not massless, but compared to protons and neutrons, it's almost nothing, right? So we're assuming the S minus is the same molar mass as neutral sulfur, so 32.066 grams per mole for S minus and then multiply by EA2, which is 694 kilojoules per mole. Now this will be positive. The EA1 was negative, EA2 is positive. So to two significant digits, I get 20.77 kilojoules, right? Good to two sig figs, so that zero is significant. Now we just add those together, right? If it was, if we were doing like the phosphide ion, we'd have an EA3, we'd have to do a third step. I didn't have room on my board. So let's take the negative 5.999 kilojoules, good to two sig figs, Add it to the 20.77 kilojoules, good to two sig figs. But notice, this two significant digits is good to the tenths place, or one decimal. This two significant figures is good to the ones place. There's no decimal places. So when you're adding, you're limited by the largest absolute uncertainty. This has an absolute uncertainty of plus or minus one kilojoule. This is plus or minus 0.1 kilojoule. So one is bigger than 0.1. So we're limited to the ones place. So we get four, now remember, this is positive, that's negative. So we end up with 14.77 kilojoules, good to the ones place. So that rounds up to 15 kilojoules. So you know how to do the math. Watch out for sometimes they're negative, sometimes they're positive. But the second EA2s, EA3s are always positive, usually massively so. Let's look at some trends. All right, trends for electron affinity are a lot more confusing than trends for ionization energy because you can have negative and positive values. Ionization is only positive, so it's easy to compare. So it's really easy to get your mind all, all twisted up here. So think about favorability. More favorable, more exothermic, more negative. Less favorable, endothermic, more positive, or less negative. Ready? 
because of the the greater dependence on electron configurations when you're adding electrons there's a lot more exceptions to the point where it's almost hard to say there's a distinct trend going along along a, a row or down a column nothing like atomic size trends or ionization energy trends and there's even some exceptions in ionization energies with electron configurations but it gets a little wacko for uh, electron affinities but in general in general, if you're moving down a column, it gets less favorable, all right, to add electrons, which means they're less negative or more positive. All right? Moving across a row like this, electron affinity becomes more favorable. You can think Non-metals like to gain electrons to become like anions, right? Metals don't. That's a general way to think about it. So metals, metals over here we know would rather lose electrons to become like the prior noble gas, whereas non-metals want to gain electrons. So you can kind of think of it that way. So as you move across, it becomes more favorable or more negative. There's a lot of exceptions to that based on are the electron configurations half filled, totally filled, right? So let's take a look at some of those, uh, some specific values and some, a lot of exceptions. So I kind of did a little blow up of the electron affinities. I have this on my website if you want to use it, just some values I collected. Got rid of all the transition metals, but we tend to focus more for non-metals because that's what's usually forming anions, right? So we're going to use the non-metals. But notice there's some things that break the trend. Um, as we move across a row, so I just got silicon to argon here. So I just went from silicon right here over to argon and then germanium over to krypton. So I did this little block right here. It's about the, the juiciest trends I could find. They, they get a little wacky. But as you can see, going left to right across the column tends to become more negative. But there's a big exception here with phosphorus and the noble gases. So it's more negative jumps, more negative, more negative, and then, whoa, becomes highly endothermic. Same thing. Uh, germanium across, right? There's a, there's a distinct break in the trend, more negative, more negative, then boom, the noble gas is huge. Moving down a column, right? Do you see how it becomes less favorable in most? Not true for here, but less favorable, less favorable, right? Not a perfect trend. But what I want to look at is what is going on right there. What causes that big jump? It's definitely less favorable to gain an electron for this column right here, the panictogens. Right? So that would be, so something must be funky about the electron configuration when you jump from aluminum to silicon. Once you get to phosphorus, Trying to add an electron to phosphorus, arsenic, antimony, bismuth is way harder than the other ones for some weird reason. It's way less favorable. So let's look at the electron configuration and figure that out. And then, what's going on there, man? It's like, yeah, more favorable, more favorable. Oh, heck with you. I don't want any more. Hopefully it makes sense. It's a full electron shell. It doesn't want any more. So let's take a look specifically here, and I, I won't do electron configurations here. I'll just talk about there's certain types of electron configurations that are always going to be endothermic. They never want electrons. So let's look at those. I wrote up some electron configurations for you. Let's see if you can come up with the answer. So here's silicon, phosphorus, uh, and sulfur, the same trends, you know, whether it's the, the N equals 3, N equals 4, N equals 5. We see the same trend when we're going from 2p electrons 3p electrons to 4. We're trying to add another electron in, right? So let's take a look at silicon. It's 3s2, 3p2. Right? You can see that from the periodic table. So silicon's there, so it's neon, 3s2, 3p2. And phosphorus is 3p3, sulfur is 3p4. There you go. So phosphorus has three electrons there, sulfur has three. So they all have the same in the 3s. So that's, we're not worried about the 3s. It's the 3p. So why is it adding an electron here releases 133.6 kilojoules per mole for neon? But adding an electron to phosphorus drops way, way down to negative 72. It's way less favorable. Why is that happening? Right? 
you'd think it'd be more favorable because you're closer to its preferred electron configuration, but something weird's going on there. And then with sulfur, you're adding electron to go there and it jumps back up to negative 200.4 and becomes even more negative. So we're adding an electron. Let me get a different color here. So we're adding an electron there, adding an electron there, and adding an electron there. I'm going to pause this. I want you to take a, a, about 30 seconds and see if you can answer why that is much less favorable. You can do it. So we're looking at this, this main exception right here where the chalcogens, not the chalcogens, the benictogens are way less favorable than you'd think. The nitrogen, the phosphorus, the arsenic, the antimony. Why is that happening? Well, that's the only one with a half-filled 3P subshell. So hopefully you thought about this. There's two factors, really. One, see, this one's favorable because it's going to half fill. Remember, half filled subshells are favorable, right? They're favorable, they're more symmetric. So, this one will get symmetric and be happy. This one, you're cramming one in there and breaking up that half filled subshell symmetry, so it's not really happy about that. And remember, electrons like to remain unpaired if they can, so you're forcing. So here you're not forcing electron pairing, but here you're forcing electron pairing. So you get that electron-electron repulsion, which makes that less. Now, it still wants to become like the next noble gas, so it's still favorable, but a lot less favorable than that one. And then over here, you're not, you're not disrupting the half-filled shell already. You are creating a little electron pairing energy sticking it in there, but you're still getting way closer to a preferred electron configuration, so it becomes more favorable that way. So watch out. You don't want to disrupt those half-filled subshells. So let me show you some distinct ones that are always endothermic, and we'll be done. All right, here's some scenarios where you can say, you know, it's going to be positive, right? So here's some uh, species that always have endothermic or positive EA values, not favorable. Noble gases, they are already filled. They are where they're at the happy place, right? Everything else, all these nonmetals are trying to become them. So when you've got a full valence shell, hey, it, you could cram another one in, but it's going to take a lot of energy. It doesn't want that to happen. So those are always, always endothermic. Anions. Negative electron, negative anion, eee, repulsion energies. Those are always going to be positive or not favorable. Now, we're not going to be dealing with metals gaining electrons in my class, but you can think of transition metals with, remember, the, 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 the lower energy favored states for transition metals, we talked about when we lose electrons to form cations, is to get an empty or half-filled subshell. Now, filled is also more stable. So half, and in this case, if we're adding electrons, Half filled and filled are favorable scenarios. They're symmetric electron distributions within the, the orbitals. So if they are half filled or filled already, adding that next electron is not going to be a favorable process, right? Um, we can't quite say that for the p orbitals. It's true for nitrogen, right? It's actually endothermic, but not true for these other ones. Now, it's distinctly less favorable like we talked about, um, but not necessarily endothermic. So. Number three, not a big deal with us because we're not going to form transition metal anions in my class, but definitely noble gases and anions always going to be positive. We've got electron affinity. Almost done with this um, whole entire topic on property trends. We're going to look at some reactivity next time.